Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by a respected musician who established her musical career in the 1960s. My guest was born and raised in a musical family with her siblings. She started playing guitar aged 11 and sang folk songs with her family. She would eventually form a harmony singing duo with her sister Maggie and began performing at colleges around the country. The pair were mentored by Paul Simon and would perform backup vocals on Paul's second solo album. Some years later, the sisters became a trio when Susie joined them to form the band The Roaches. They soon built a following and a loyal fan base and signed to Warner Records in 1979. The self-entitled debut album won critical acclaim and was named by the New York Times as the best album of the year. The Roaches spent two decades in the music business. They constantly toured, appeared on countless TV shows, and worked with the Indigo Girls, Kathy Matea, Don Wass, Philip Glass, and Tracy Ullman. My guest has gone on to solo musical endeavours, performing in other bands, appearing in an opera, music teaching, I'm writing her new book. Can you see that, son? Today I'm joined by Terry Roach, who takes us on a musical pilgrimage and tries to summarise her life, work and creative output across six decades. A very warm welcome, Terry. Thank you kindly for joining me today on well, Your Take. Thank you for having me, James. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you again. There's um, a lot to, to get through and discuss just through that introduction alone. Lots to decipher and we'll talk about your musical journey. I thought that the best way to start, Terry, would be to wind the clock back and go back to the very beginnings. You were born in New York City in 1953, but grew up in New Jersey Terry, can I ask you, what are your memories of childhood and adolescence? And can you give us some background on your parents and what they did for work? Yes, um, our parents met in a small theater company. They were both acting in a play in Buffalo, New York. And uh, that's how they met. And eventually, they uh, moved to New York City. Um, and they did not continue in the acting uh, profession, but they did um, continue writing. My mother wrote copy for advertising and my father directed a lot of commercials for Chrysler radio spots and stuff. So we, we grew up with this awareness of creating things like uh, commercials. And we used to pretend, <laughs> we used to pretend we were saying, we would make commercials up, you know, jingles and things like that. Whereas somebody else's kid would be playing doctor or nurse or something, you know. Because so we had an awareness in the family of uh, making things up and creating things, and it was very much respected in our in our family. However, we did not, as a family, sing together or anything like that. It was more like you would, like if you got in trouble, which uh, I did often, you know, it, you would be sent to your room, but, but the instruction would be, you know, go, go upstairs and draw a picture, you know, or write a story. These were things that like were valued uh, and, and television was 
kind of, you know, it was monitored. We weren't allowed to sit in front of the television uh, endlessly, you know. So you were encouraged to go do something creative it, it, as a way of calming yourself down, I guess, <laughs> if you were uh, throwing a tantrum or something. Terry, we've established that you come from a creative family background and you were brought up in the the 1950s. I want to pick up on this family, family life, and ask you, you come from this large family, you have two sisters, Maggie and Susie, and a brother, David. Can you just describe what it was like growing up in a family surrounded by siblings? And can you describe your personalities and were you particularly close to one another? Well, have you ever seen a litter of kittens? I have, yeah. Right? So, and you know how, you know, sometimes it looks violent. You know, you, you know they're throwing each other around and scratching each other. And, but they never really hurt one another. So I would describe my relationship with my siblings a little bit like that. It's almost like you're in a family. We had four siblings. In a family, you, you're teaching one another how to be out in the world. And part of that is how to fight, how to have a fight with someone. And, you know, and so you're learning how to, you know, aggravate someone or you know, and then you get your feelings hurt. And so there was a lot of bickering that went on. And I remember my father used to say, don't compete. <laughs> and I couldn't understand what he was talking about. What do you mean, don't compete? <laughs> but it must have been difficult, you know, to have these four energetic, very different personalities, all four of us. Uh, you didn't have, like, everyone the same type. So there was a lot of lively interaction, I would say. Can we come on to the, the music? But specifically, I want to focus on the discovery of music. And can you share with us the music that you were exposed to in the house at a young age and also the music you were discovering off your own back? and how you heard that music for the for the very first time? Well, early on, I remember um, our mother was a real fan of like classical music, symphonies and concertos and things, and she would play those records. And I, in particular, really, you know, loved listening to uh, to those things. Then also we were in the Catholic school and we were in the choir. So that was, you know, where you learned how to be on a part when somebody across the room was singing a different note, you know, than you. Uh, and then the other thing was the AM radio, which was in New York. They had uh, two stations, they had WABC and WMCA, and they were, the disc jockeys were playing all the hits, you know, in the 60s, of, uh, and it was very, very diverse. You know, you'd get Louis Armstrong, and then you'd get uh, the Supremes, you know, the um, Motown, then you'd get Chuck Berry, and then you'd get the Beatles, then you'd get Simon and Garfunkel. It was a lot of variety, uh, in one half hour, you'd hear all these different things. So I would say the AM radio, the choir, and my mother's uh, LPs that she had of uh, like Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto was one of her favorites. And, you know, I would say those influences were always there. Plus, our father worked, he, worked uh, directing radio commercials uh, for Chrysler. He worked for an ad agency and he 
was often in the studio, uh, the RCA studios. And so sometimes he'd bring his kids to work, not often, but we'd get to go in there and see the studio, how, what that was. And um, so we were very uh, exposed to microphones and tape recorders. We had a tape recorder at home, you know. So it was, but and it was unusual at that point to have that kind of um, awareness of a recording studio. And he used to bring home records. I guess they were records that nobody wanted because I never heard of any of them. And my friends didn't have any of these. Like there was one called Sing Along with Millard Fillmore. And what this was, was a, uh, an LP of campaign songs for various presidents of the United States down through the ages. And we would have that going on constant rotation and we all learned how to sing along with, with those songs about the, the candidates running for president. <laughs> it's interesting because you're exposed to many different forms of music. You mentioned your mother's interest in classical, and you've mentioned this golden age period with music on AM radio, and you're being influenced by all different genres from soul to, to rock, mm -hmm. um, the golden age of American and, and British music. I wanted to kind of put that aside to one minute and then talk about the influences and also being in that kind of studio environment with your dad being involved in, in radio broadcasting and radio writing in, in terms of advertising and talk about your discovery of and actually playing music. You began playing guitar very young at the age of 11. Can you recall your first guitar and did you learn to play the instrument on your own accord or were you given lessons and can you also talk about your family learning and performing together and did you have a desire even at that young age to actually go on and become a musician well i we didn't have any music lessons in in, in our uh, family except when i was 8 years old, I wanted to play the accordion. And so, and that was because my mother was taking accordion lessons. So they got me a little accordion and um, I never practiced. So it only lasted for about a month, the accordion lessons. And then there were no more lessons for anybody really in the family that I remember until 1964, when uh, I think that's when the Beatles came to America and they were, you know, uh, everyone wanted to be the Beatles or be the Beatles' girlfriend or something, you know. <clears throat> and so my parents got Maggie, my older sister Maggie, a little nylon string guitar for Christmas. And that January, right after the Christmas, there was a show on public uh, TV called Folk Guitar with Laura Weber. And it was, Laura Weber would teach you a folk song every week. There'd be one folk song. And so she'd teach you the strum that went with it and the chords that went with it. So we had this one guitar and Maggie and my mother and I and I think maybe my sister Suzy, she's three years younger than me, so I'm not sure. But I do remember my mother and Maggie and I handing the guitar back and forth like, okay, it's your turn to play the A chord. And that's how we learned. That was our lessons, was this show. Uh, I want to come Weber. on. I want to come, come on from, we've spoken about your influences, where you first heard music and 
learning guitar at a, a young a young age at the age of 11 I wanted to come on to your schooling now Terry and you attended Park Ridge High School in New Jersey what are your recollections from your brief time there and what subjects caught your imagination and can you discuss having to drop out of school to form a musical duo uh, with your sister Maggie? Yeah, well, I would say that I really enjoyed high school. Um, I had gone to grammar school, to the Catholic grammar school, and I found the kids at that school to be very cruel. It was it reminded me of these days where you've got a lot of bullying and that sort of thing. And I was not particularly bullied myself, but I noticed, you know, that dynamic. There was an in crowd of girls and boys that were real popular that used to pick on other people. And I was afraid when I went to high school, it was the public high school, and I was afraid that uh, the kids there were going to be really, really worse because I thought, well, you know, we're at the Catholic school, we're, we're going to church and we're praying and stuff, so we should be good, you know. But if we're bad like that, then I'm terrified to go to the public school. I can't imagine what they're going to be like. But they, it was the opposite. The kids were, maybe because we were older, the ninth grade, you know, you're a little older. And uh, I just really liked, I liked the kids, I liked the teachers and the subjects, and it was great. What happened was that uh, Maggie started writing songs. As soon as she got the um, chords, as soon as we learned some chords and we learned some of these folk songs, she just went off in the direction of writing songs, you know. I had no interest really in it. it. It was not something that I was interested in doing, but I really liked the guitar and playing the guitar. So she would write a song and then she would teach me the melody and she had a great ear for harmony. She'd construct these harmonies and I would figure out a second guitar part. So we would be in our room doing this feverishly. Like we were, the, the funny thing is that no one was making us practice or telling us to do this. You know, we just got really on fire about doing this and it was being driven really by these songs that she was coming up with. And that's what largely is on the Can You See That Sun book. This moves on beautifully to the next chapter and leads into my next question. And can you just discuss forming a harmony group with your sister and also talk about how you were discovered when performing at the Bitter End Coffee Shop by talent scout Marilyn Lipsus? Yes. Uh, so... This was the summer between my junior and senior year of uh, high school, and my parents had a friend who was subletting his apartment in, the, in Greenwich Village. So he had this studio apartment, this little apartment, and Maggie and I were allowed to uh, move into it for the summer. You know, so my father worked in the city. You know, we lived in New Jersey, out in the suburbs there. And, um, well, I, I really should back up a little bit because we had uh, gone into the city to audition for a show on WBAI, which was kind of the pro progressive... Uh, radio station, Izzy Young was the name of the guy whose show it was, and he had this folk program. So our father had taken us in to audition for him. And do you know who Dave Van Ronk is? Yeah, I do, yeah. 
so we were doing, we went to audition for Izzy Young and Dave Van Ronk was there and we didn't know who he was, you know, <clears throat> but he was impressed with us and he brought us around the corner to meet his wife at the time, Terry Thal, and she started managing us. She wanted to manage, she was, they were very impressed with these two. And by then I think we were probably 15, you know? Yeah, I'd say we were 15. So we would, Dave got us uh, to open the show for people at the Gaslight and at the Bitter End, which were the, the clubs in the village where the folk scene was happening. And we kind of came around toward the end of the scene. You know, the 1960s in Greenwich Village was a very vibrant, you know, Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and Tim Buckley and Tim Harden, all these people that we had never heard of. We heard we had heard of Bob Dylan and he was the only one. We had never heard of any of these people. So we'd be coming in and hanging out with them, you know, and, you know, or at the club, we'd be in the club with Van Ronk and he'd be sort of holding court, you know, with, with all these folk musicians. And I remember being very intimidated by, you know, we were just these little kids coming in from the suburbs, you know. Uh, and Terry Thal, she took us under her wing. She really did. She's the one who brought us to audition for Mal Marilyn Lipsius and the coffee house circuit. And that was uh, the summer of my, would have been my senior year. And they, Marilyn came backstage and offered us a contract to go all over the United States to various colleges and play in the coffee houses at the colleges. And Terry Thaw was also the person who uh, told us that Paul Simon was teaching a songwriting class at NYU. And we went over and just sat in the lobby. Maggie went and sat in the lobby and waited for him to come in and introduced herself to him. And he uh, listened to a couple of our songs and then invited us to join the class. And that's where we met Tom Mandel. Incredible to be mixing with these household names or what would become household names in, in music. And obviously you mentioned Paul Simon, who I'm going to come on to very shortly in the, the course of the narrative. But before we talk about Paul Simon acting as a kind of mentor um, to you both, I wanted to ask you about, uh, about voice and singing in harmony together. And can I ask you to describe Maggie's voice and your own? And why do you think you work so well together? And can you also discuss Maggie's ability to write clever, clever, brilliant songs. She had this, this ability as a, as a wordsmith. Yeah, well, uh, Maggie has, or had, a, a very low voice. She was in the tenor range, but she also could go as high as I could go. So we were very complimentary, the, the two voices, you know. Um, I would usually do the melodies and she would do the harmony. She had a, that ear for harmony and it was pretty natural. I, I can't, we didn't study about it. We didn't know the names of what we were doing. It wasn't like I could say, oh, I'm th singing the third and you're singing the nine. You know, it, we just, it was like we were in the sandbox playing, you know, and making these things up. And I really think that it had a lot to do with the fact that no one was really monitoring this or telling us that we had to do this. We, we just, I think we realized that we had this chemistry uh, 
to be able to figure these songs out together, you know, and it was, um, and we would often be bickering with each other, you know, it wasn't like, you know, sometimes people, they portray sisters and siblings in this way of like, oh, sisters, you know, it wasn't like that. It was more like, you know, the, uh, the litter of kittens, you know, punching each other around, you know, we, we were all four of us in my family. We were all very strong personalities, different from each other. And, you know, it was kind of a lively uh, energy of people. <laughs> it's, it's interesting you mentioned about this relationship with siblings or this kind of rivalry, because we've heard about it so many times in music, a classic example with the Don and Phil Everly, the, the Everly brothers who, right. you know, had this incredible musical career and will go down as two of the, the great musicians of the 20th century. And yet they kind of couldn't live together and they couldn't live without one another. They had this kind of very odd relationship. It's, it's interesting when we talk about, you mentioned about voices and not being trained and almost just learning on the job it would you say it, it all came kind of very naturally to you as performers well it seems to have when i uh, when i listen back to the music now because now i'm listening back 50 years uh that's one of the reasons i wanted to put this project out now is that someone sent me recordings of us and when I heard the arrangements and the songs and the music, I thought, oh my God, you know, uh, we were doing this when we were teenagers and it was not, we weren't really imitating anybody. You know, we were just, we were just kind of creating these things. And um, there was a sort of, I'm not, I don't even remember doing it. If I didn't hear it on the uh, recordings, I, I would, I'm so happy that someone sent me these recordings because I didn't have recordings of us. I had some of these songs on record. Eventually they were on record, but just to hear just the two of us and the guitar parts and also because it was live, there was no editing that we could, we couldn't, you know, change anything in the music. Um, t uh, Tom Miliotto, who's actually Lisa's husband, he did an amazing job of restoring the recordings, you know, because when they, they were basically done in various uh, clubs and stuff off the board. So it wasn't like there was a, studio, a mixing studio. Um, the people who recorded them did a very good job, but Tom really kind of had to make everything sound uniform because, I mean, not uniform, but so that the thing would be able to play as a whole record, one song into the next without it sounding like they were from different time periods, <clears throat> which they were. <clears throat> Let's talk about now Paul Simon, who we did briefly mention earlier on, uh, a great mentor in your life and your early musical tutorage. But can I ask you to, to give us some background on the story of how you were introduced to, to Paul Simon and how he became this mentor? And can you describe your relationship and also observing the recording process of his second solo album, and then eventually going on to perform backing vocals on his third solo album before going on to helping you sign to a production company for new performers. Well, it was actually his second solo album called There Goes Rhyme and Simon that we sang on. And we sang on a song called Was a Sunny Day. And so, we had, uh, let's see, we had gone on the coffee house circuit for a couple of years 
after taking Paul's class. And then when we were back in New York, we called Paul's office <laughs> and we called every day for a week. And so one night the whole family was sitting down having dinner and the phone rings and it's Paul and it's, you know, this is Paul Simon and what, what's the urgency? <laughs> And so he told us to, uh, we said, we've got all these songs and we want to play them for you. And so he had us go to the apartment of his business partner and lawyer, Michael Tannen. We went into the city and uh, we went to Michael's apartment and played through our repertoire and Michael offered us a contract right there, you know, with a production contract with he and Paul had this company. And uh, we kind of floated out of Michael's uh, apartment on a cloud, you know, because Paul, it wasn't just that Paul was a famous person. Maggie and I had a real thing about Simon and Garfunkel. We, we, you know, they were a real big influence in what we were doing. We felt like, you know, <clears throat> there couldn't have been a, a better person than Paul to have taken us on and mentored us. So there we were, and he allowed us to come to the studio and watch him making that record, There Goes Ryman Simon. So we we were still going out on the coffee house tours to the colleges. And at one point, we were in Pittsburgh playing at a college there. And we had three days off. And Michael Tannen told us that Paul was thinking about asking us to sing background on one of the songs on his record. Now, he was down in, in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, making this record. And we had three days off. And the way we were getting around was on Greyhound bus. And in those days, you could go anywhere on a Greyhound bus for a month for $55. So you could travel every single day on a Greyhound bus f for this uh, $55. So we got on the bus and went down to Muscle Shoals and just showed up at the studio. And uh, sure enough, you know, there was that moment of, I hope we heard this right. I hope he invited us, he wanted us to come here and do this. And that's how we wound up on his record. When you look back at the early half of your musical career, and performing at, at such a, a young age, how do you summarize that musical journey performing in a duo with Maggie? And can you also discuss life on the road and how you discovered interests in astrology, spirituality, and also uh, a kick for health foods? Well, you know, I'll tell you, I think one of the interesting things about me as a performer and being on a you know stage and stuff is that I never had a desire to do that as a kid. Like a lot of people that I know, they were like, oh, when I heard the Beatles, I wanted to be on stage. I would say that Maggie was driving the bus. She was writing those songs. She, she was passionate about what she was doing, the writing of the songs and the... And I sort of got hooked on the lifestyle, the idea that I could be driving across Nebraska with my sister on the way to some college instead of sitting in math class. You know, it was like the... I thought, I like this music thing, you know, so I had to sort of pay attention and learn how to sing and learn how to play my parts, you know. So um, I just 
I think that's a, a little unusual. I don't know too many people that wound up doing that for a living that did not have a desire to do it as a kid. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. You sometimes speak to some people who maybe do a profession that you particularly inspired by or a part of you has a jealous streak and think I would love to do that and when you speak to them at length they sometimes say well I kind of fell into this by accident or you know or I or I spoke to somebody and they showed me the way or they gave me this opportunity so yeah it's quite it's quite interesting but I guess in in terms of creativity whether it's acting whether it's music theater or whatever normally the person tends to be, like you say, quite ambitious from an early age and has that ambition to, you know, follow through and pursue that as their ultimate career, I guess. Yeah, I would say that ambition is an element that is present a lot with people who become very popular and famous, you know, and I would think, and I do think that with us, with, with me in particular, the roaches, I think that element was not very strong. Do you think that's a, do you think that's a healthy thing in a way? I think it's just, it's just different. I think what we were, <clears throat> the thing that was turning us on and that we were passionate about was the doing of the music. And then when it came down to, uh, well, once we signed with major labels, now there was this pressure to get on the commercial radio and get a hit record because that's what you did in those days. You know, there was no YouTube sensations. Nobody was an influencer. You know what I mean? You, you had to, when you got signed to a major label, you were expected to want to have a hit record. That was what it was all about. So <clears throat> when we started to actually work and be in the situation, I think it started to become difficult because we would hand in something. I don't know how much you've listened to the Roaches records, but to me, when I listen to them, I'm really, you know, some people say, oh, I don't like to listen to my old records. I love listening back to the Roaches records. I'm really amazed at the kinds of things that we came up with. But they did not get played on the commercial radio. And so there was this constant feeling of it's failing. It's not, it didn't get on the radio. You didn't win a Grammy. You didn't, you know, you weren't like in this big time. And at this point, where I'm a couple of months away from being 70 years old, I look back on it and I think, I'm very proud of my musical career. It really is something that I think, um, I'm amazed at it really, you know? We'll, but, we'll slightly backtrack in terms of the, the narrative and we'll come on to the the formation of uh of the roaches mm -hmm. you um you formed the you moved back to new york in 1976 mm -hmm. and you spent some time in hibernation in louisiana living in a kung fu temple which i'm intrigued to to hear more about but what made you decide to return to your home city and can you discuss teaming up with your sister Suzy to eventually form the famous trio? Well, after we were in the Kung Fu Temple, which is where we went, uh, we made the record, which was partly produced by Paul Simon. It was called Seductive Reasoning. And my, my book, Can You See That Sun, largely tells the story of the making of that record. Um, and just to digress, the title, Can You See That Sun, that song was a song that 
Maggie and I wrote when she was like 13 and I was 12. It was right when we first learned those chords and um, she had those lyrics and she gave them to me and I made up the tune. And it was one of the uh, unusual in the sense that we both collaborated on it. But that that's why I titled the uh, the book, Can You See That Sun? Because it's a song about these two kids in the, in the suburbs in New Jersey who'd never traveled anywhere. And we had this thing about wanting to go out west, you know? And so that fir very first song, Can You See That Sun in the West Horizon, slowly sinking day away. He's been my guide, and we both come this fur. We, we, we said this fur, because, you know, that's us thinking this is the way people out west must speak, you know? And, and it was just, it's interesting to me to realize that we eventually did go out west and go traveling around and, and really have that experience, but that was the very first expression of wanting to do something like that. I don't think I answered your question. <laughs> let's um let's come on and talk about the the infancy of the the roaches during the early years because you eventually started performing as a trio and you find yourself performing at Folk City. Can you talk about the early years of performing as that trio and how you managed to start attracting crowds and a, a loyal following before the actual um the the um, being signed to the Warner Brothers label yes well after we after Maggie and I came back from the kung fu experience in Louisiana um we had jobs as bartenders at Folk City and at the time, Suzy was going to college uh, at SUNY Purchase, um, and she would come into the city, uh, like, you know, when, on weekends. And we, the three of us, around Christmas time, got together and, and worked up three part arrangements of Christmas carols. And we went in the street. We went out, you know, to the bars and we went, went in the street. And of course, at Christmas time, that's a that's a pretty big win for busking. You know, we weren't very good buskers. We were too soft. You know what I mean? It wasn't like nobody was gonna be dancing. And we would try, even when we went to London at one point, uh, we went to London to make the seductive reasoning record, and um, part of it was done there with Paul Samuel Smith. I don't know if you know his work, but he was in the Yardbirds, and he was became a producer. He produced Cat, Cat Stevens and Paul Simon and some people, so they sent us over there to work with him. And we did try to do some busking in London, but we were terrible at it. We weren't loud enough you know, but Christmas carols at Christmas time in Greenwich Village was really cool. It was like, you know, people would stop and throw money in your hat there. So when Christmas was over, we had had a good time working up these three part arrangements of things. And we thought, well, let's keep going. Let's, let's write some songs and let's just keep doing this three part thing. Uh, Maggie and I had quit. Uh, we had walked out of our contract with Columbia Records and we had gone down to this town Hammond in Louisiana with the Kung Fu Temple. And that's where Maggie wrote the song, the Hammond song, which is probably the most popular Roaches song. You know, we always played that song, every show. But well, that was one of the first ones we worked up as a trio, was the Hammond song, because she had written this 
down in uh, the Kung Fu temple. And then we started to, you know, just create things and we would get together. And um, we were always very structured about our rehearsing. You know, we would rehearse from like one to five every day. And you would just get in that room and stuff would happen. And sometimes it wouldn't happen, but you'd show up in between your bartending jobs and your waitress jobs and things. You mentioned earlier on about the pressures of working for a major label and then ultimately wanting you to come up with a, a huge hit for them. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about how Warner Brothers made the approach to sign you to the label? And what were your initial thoughts about signing to the label at the time? And did you have any reservations? Well, uh, no, because um, the first experience that Maggie and I had with seductive reasoning, we wound up feeling like we had failed. You know, we, we, we left because we felt that we didn't belong in the music business. You know, we, we, we felt like the people were trying so hard to make it, the music, into a commercial uh, thing that would get on the radio. And we just felt like we're going to make fools of ourselves if we continue to you know, they were trying to tell us what to wear and how to be. And we just felt like the experience with Columbia Records, we felt like failures. The next thing with the trio was an entirely different situation because we started performing in the street and then we played at Folk City and we played at Kenny's Castaways and we started to attract attention. So now the music that we're doing is attracting an audience and that attracts record companies. A very different scenario from Paul Simon signing us and him bringing us to Columbia Records. You know, this was like, okay, so now people are lining up around the block to come in and hear, hear this music. At the same time, Robert Fripp, uh, some, uh, someone brought Robert Fripp to hear us. And uh, the person called me up and said, listen, Robert Fripp came to your show last night and he'd like to talk to you about producing you. And we had no idea who he was, you know. And then she, she, she said, King Crimson, you know, and I remembered that album with the big mouth, you know, and I said, oh yeah, I, 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 I know that album, but I didn't know his name. So, turns out he had been in some sort of spiritual community for like two years or something. He had left the music business and gone into some kind of uh, meditation type I know I'm not explaining it correctly, but any Robert Fripp fans know about that period of his where he just disappeared for two years and went into a spiritual community. He had just come out of that. And Warner Brothers was talking to him about wanting him to produce somebody. You know, they wanted to do a production deal with him. So he goes to Warner Brothers and says, I saw the group that I want to produce, and uh, it's the Roaches. At the same time, they had approached us about signing with them. So now they have this situation where Robert Fripp wants to work with these three girls and their acoustic guitars. And it was like, why? Like, why? Who came up with that combination? So because of that, there was a lot of advance attention before our record came out. And Robert was the person who decided it should just be acoustic guitars and voices. And this was not what was being played uh, 
on the commercial radio, and it's probably the reason that that record did not get played on the radio, but it got a lot of attention. It got a lot of press and people saying, what is this? And then the New York Times comes out and says, it's the best record of the year. So the whole thing was really interesting, very, you could not have planned that or predicted it. It was like a pool table, you know, and the balls just went in different directions. And uh, next thing you know, there we were having the record, best record of the year. <laughs> Interestingly, Terry, how do you look back at that debut self-entitled album and what are your recollections from the recording sessions? And also, how do you look back at the critical reaction and the the acclaim? You mentioned, obviously, it being um, coined the, the best album of the year by the New York Times at, the, at that period. I would imagine that that was kind of opening many doors for you on just off the back of the, you know, the uh, the attention from the album. That's a good way of putting it, James. You know, it was like all of a sudden there was all this attention. Um, I think I was about 26 years old at that point, you know. Um, you know, it, it was snowballing into this big thing. And I remember thinking that, you know, we're as big as the Beatles. You know, we were in all the magazines and the newspapers and people wanted to interview us wherever we went, you know. It was interesting. It's interesting because we picked up a little bit on fame early on and I, I kind of wanted to talk about it briefly. You mentioned that the doors had opened and you were being exposed to live television shows on the front cover of magazines, all of a sudden you're in the kind of spotlight, people are familiar who you are, and I guess you become a, a brand in a way. Mm -hmm. Did you, was that exciting to begin with, being on that roller coaster ride? And did you enjoy that for a, a period of time? Or for you, was it kind of very difficult to deal with that side of the, the music industry? Well, I think it was both things. I think it was very exciting, you know, and also, you know, all of a sudden your friends are, are impressed and you're playing at Carnegie Hall and, and everyone that knows you is very impressed. And it was a whirlwind of a, of a time, you know. Um, but there were things about it. We were part of a pretty vibrant scene in in the village that was playing at Folk City. There was lots of people in the scene that were writing great songs and really, um, it was, you know, it was like every night we were all out in the bars and, and listening to one another. So the New York Times had come out with an article in the front page of their arts and leisure section and it was all about how folk music is back in Greenwich Village. It was one of those articles about folk music is back and these are the people to watch. And we were featured and George Gerdes was featured, Jack Hardy was featured and Steve Forbert. The four of us were on the front and then they did mention some of the other people. But there were some wonderful songwriters in that group of friends you know mark johnson uh he was he was great i mean we all were watch would go and watch each other's show and it was a community of people that were writing these writing and performing but when all of a sudden we got singled out and got a record deal and so did Steve Forbert got a record deal. You know, now it was like, okay, we're gonna take these people and say they're the best ones in the scene. And that kind of fractured some relationships. I wanna jump forward 
a lot in the the timeline and I want you to kind of summarize and look back at your longevity and your long-term success in the roaches because you produced 12 albums you appeared on countless tv shows worked with many other high profile artists the indigo girls kathy matea philip glass tracy Ullman, and you even featured as animated characters but what for you have been the high points and have there been many difficult moments throughout the tenure of the group I would say, you know, life in general has had <laughs> many difficult moments and many high points, you know. Um, I don't think of my career in music and thinking, oh, that was a high point, you know. Um, I think probably the most prominent venue we ever played in was Carnegie Hall and we sold out Carnegie Hall, and that was a big triumph. You know, everyone was, we were all happy about that. But life on the road is, you know, it's interesting about fame because you, when that happens to a person, it changes a lot of things in your life. And you don't know until that happens whether you like it, you know, you think maybe that's what you wanted, but then the reality of it, um, people being envious of you, people saying things in the newspapers, you know, like people would say things like, yeah, the roaches. I remember one time we went to LA, Los Angeles, and the, and the lead, uh, sentence in the story about us was the roaches the group that LA loves to hate <laughs> you know and you'd or you'd read something like Maggie's the best songwriter Suzy and Terry shouldn't even write songs you know like you and this is your family this is your this is your uh, little co you know collection of people that are doing this very creative thing you know so at times it was, it was, it was different. Like, I mean, we had our third record as the Roaches is called Keep On Doing. That song, Keep On Doing, was a song that Suzy and I wrote about a friend of hers who had just gotten slammed in the newspapers with a play that he had been working on for a long time and it's almost an accident when you get a reviewer who goes after you like that, you know? So that song, Keep On Doing, was kind of our song to everybody that was having that happen. Because it's a horrible feeling, you know? You, you, it's very vulnerable to open up your talent and your ideas and your songs and your it's a vulnerable thing to do but you know we've had things thrown at us on stage and stuff you know it's it it's not for everyone <laughs> fame you know we turn the clock back now to 1997 when you decided to put the roaches on long-term hold can you talk about why that decision was made? And can you talk in detail about some of your solo endeavours, some of the other bands you've been involved with, performing in an opera, and also working with the, the likes of Robert Fripp and other music artists? Well, Robert Fripp, I really liked working with Robert Fripp for the reason that he was, his approach, uh, was particularly good for me. Like, for example, when I sang, he, he had me sing on his record. You know, uh, he had a record called Exposure and he asked me to sing three songs on that record. One of them was a duet with Peter Hamill. Do you know Peter Hamill's work? He's English. Yeah. Um, 
So, so here we are in the studio. I had never heard the song. Robert did not send either of us the song. We get in the studio. We had never met. And he puts me on one microphone, Peter on the other, and we're looking at each other. And we're both on mic. And now we get the lyrics, the set of lyrics, right? We've never heard the song before. So we put the headphones on and our instruction was to trade lines. In other words, you sing your line, then I sing my line, then you sing your line, and I sing my line. We had no idea how long the song was. We had no idea how this was going to be. We had never heard it before. So we're singing stuff that are written lyrics to a track we'd never heard before. And uh, that song is on the, the record Exposure. It's called, um, the song is called, I may not have had enough of me, but I've had enough of you. <laughs> so that type of thing, you know, to be put in a situation where you didn't know what you were going to do, and you were going to basically improvise with another person you'd never met, you know. That really opened up my, uh, it really opened me up about music and just what it could be besides everything being planned out, which uh, was what I was used to. And why was the decision to put the, the band on hold? And I also wanted to ask you about some of your favourite solo endeavours and some of the other bands you've been in, some of the, the highlights for you and projects that kind of mean a lot creati creatively to you. Well, one of my favourite ones is Afro Jersey. I don't know if you've heard that music, but that... The, I guess the beginning of that project was when I um, I wanted to learn how to play some kind of hand drum, you know. And so I uh, went to a school in New York, the Geneva Dance and Drum School, to take some lessons in djembe drum. And that's where I met Siddiqui Kande. And I wound up studying with him privately uh, on the djembe drum. And then when he learned that I played guitar, he drafted me into his band. And his band was African music. I'd never played African music, or, but he would sing to me what he wanted me to play on the guitar. And he'd point at the guitar. Uh, and then I learned the, the song, the singing, phonetically. I wrote out, he, he, would, he would sing it to me, and I would record it and go home and then write it out phonetically. And when I went to the first rehearsal, I was one of four singers, and the other three were African. And they, when I started to sing these words, they all fell on the floor laughing because I guess it was just odd sounding. I don't know, I was not pronouncing them the way, and I had no idea what I was singing, you know? So, but anyway, so I was in Siddiqui's band for about five gigs, and the whole thing kind of came to an end, but a year later, I called him up and I said, I got an idea, let's you and me, why don't we write songs together? But the deal is, we both have to sing in both languages. We have to sing in Mandingo, which is his language, and English. And so I had to sing in his language and he had to sing in, in my language. And so every song had to have some of each of us in it. And a friend of ours came to see us when we would play we would draw about seven people in, in, in the club, you know, that we were playing in. 
But one of them was Marlon Cherry, who's a multi-instrumentalist and really good musician. And, you know, he kept coming to see us when we would play. And finally, Siddiqui said to him, Marlon, you got to be in the band. So the band Afro Jersey is me, Siddiqui Conde, and Marlon Cherry. And we made a CD. You know, we did a Kickstarter campaign and we raised some money to make a CD. And it's all songs where we're singing in both languages. All three of us are singing in the different languages. And that, that was one of my favorite projects. It, it became difficult because we couldn't really get, you know, the whole thing of playing in clubs, you have to draw a crowd. So you have to uh, be able to fill the seats, you know. And I would say that as a solo performer, that has not been my strong suit, <laughs> you know. I think uh, I just don't have that thing. Some people, they, you know, you know, I thought Afro Jersey was going to be a lot more interesting to people than it turned out to be, you know. Let's come on and talk about the new book and the album as well called Kenya See That Sun, which is yeah. a rare collection of live recordings of Maggie and yourself during your teen years. What made you decide to take on this project and how long did it take to compile the book and find recordings and photographs from the uh, from the archive? And I also wanted to ask what the reaction to the project's been and what are your thoughts on the the finished album and the book? Well, that yeah, thanks for asking about that, James. That's um, been an amazing uh, project for me because it began with someone sent me one live recording of me and Maggie. See, in 2000, Maggie and I went on a tour, just the two of us, it wasn't the Roaches, and we revised these arrangements of the songs that we had done as teenagers. So this person sent me um, uh, one of the songs that had been recorded from uh, one of those shows and asked me if I would like to have that there were full, two full uh, sets that we had done that had been recorded in Albany at a recording, or it was a, it was a gig in front of a live audience. And um, it was recorded by Pat Tessitore, who's a engineer up there in Albany. And he had two complete sets of me and Maggie. So I said, of course, and, and this, the person who contacted me, whose name was Bill, on um, Facebook, you know, through Facebook. So I said, sure, I'd love to hear these, you know. And so that was the beginning of this project, was getting these recordings and sitting down and listening to them and thinking, oh my God, I can't believe we did this. You know, it was 50 years ago that these songs were created and uh, arranged. That was the beginning of it. Terry, we nearly come to that point of the interview. It's nearly that time where we ask all your take guests the same questions. Every single guest is asked these questions. They're quick fire questions to wrap the interview. But before we move on to that stage, I wanted to ask you outside of music, what are your interests and hobbies and future goals? And second to that, do you have a family? And if so, what's their take on your musical output and your uh, career? Well, I don't have any children, but I have a life partner, Gary Dial, who is a jazz pianist. And we've been together for 30 years. And um, I would say 
outside of music, I've always loved animals. You know, that's what I wanted to do when I was a little kid. I wanted to work as a veterinarian or a horse trainer or something. So I'd say if I have another interest besides music, it's animals, and that includes people. You know, <laughs> I, I like to kind of interact with other beings, especially as I get older, I realize that, you know, we're here, we have a limited time that we're on this planet. And so, like right now, how did you and I wind up, you know, why would we have crossed each other's paths, you know? And, and so I think, you know, just that going forward, I would say that that's an, in, if, if that constitutes an interest, you know, just kind of being in the world and interacting with people. And every once in a while, my particular talent for music, which I don't consider it to be a big talent. I feel like I uh, am a good sport. You know, I'll show up and attempt things, you know, but I don't consider myself to be a musical, you know, prodigy or genius or anything, but it has been a beautiful way to go through life, to interact with people, you know. It's, it, it's interesting that you say you're a, a people person because I've only spoken to you within the last 60 minutes or so, our, our conversation, but you come across as a very warm, open, honest and very humble person but I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is interesting. I think if you make that ep effort as a person to talk and engage with different people from all walks of backgrounds, um, different generations, like you say, everyone does have a, a story. And when you delve into their past and the things they've done or the things they've had to go through in their lives, whether they be high points or particularly low points, you can find out some very fascinating things, can't you? Yeah, and also I think that there's a mystery about what we're all doing here. Why are we here? What is this, you know? And so, you know, you go to the store and, and whoever is uh, behind the counter, you know, that person is part of this whole thing too, <laughs> you know? So whoever you encounter, at this point in my life, I'm not, I don't have much ambition about, oh, I wish I could achieve this, or I wish I could get to this point. I'm, I'm more like enjoying the uh, effects of having been alive for 70 years and the, you know, the, the heartbreaking things and the incredible, uh, joyful things side by side, you know? And, you know, as you get older, your friends start peeling off and leaving the earth. And so dealing with that and consoling everyone involved and being in it together, I'd say that is, is as far as I go in terms of having a feeling about the future terry roach we come to that time we ask all your take guests what we call these quick fire questions there's 13 in total we kind of want to establish things maybe we don't know about you necessarily and maybe things we've not established over the course of the last 60 minutes are you ready for this i hope so <laughs> you don't need to think about these in any great detail Let's go for this. Here we go. Number one, Terry Roach. What would you say, Terry, is your favorite pastime? Hmm. Daydreaming. Um, I'm one for you on daydreaming. I am a great daydreamer. <laughs> I think all my life I've been in a daydream, um, thinking that in another lifetime I was a great musician or a great sports person or 
was a kind of iconic film director. And sadly, my eldest son has got the same uh, knack as I have. He is a big daydreamer, but uh, we'll move that aside. But yeah, daydreaming is your favourite pastime. How old is he, your oldest son? He's seven, my oldest son, and he loves to daydream. It's quite, um, <laughs> it's nice to see, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's at the right age to be a daydreamer, I guess. But I like daydreaming. Yeah. Nothing wrong with daydreaming. Um, Terry, we go from daydreaming now to favourite film. What would you choose as your favourite, all-time favourite movie? And why would you select that film? La Strada is my favourite movie of all time. And I think the reason is because I really identified with the character Julietta Messina was playing. You have chosen a masterful filmmaker, uh, Fellini, who I think is one of the great filmmakers of all time. Um, did go through a little Fellini phase during the lockdown and watch stuff like Eight and a Half and some of his great films, a, a great choice there. La Strada as your favourite film. Um, we go from cinema now to novelists. Who would you choose as your favourite? You know, and of course, it goes without saying that you really don't have a favorite. It's like you go from one, you know, you go through, you go down the rabbit hole of different writers and things. But I would have to say, in terms of writing, John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath, and also Of Mice and Men, those two books, well, they, but there's so many great books, you know, the Brontes, the Bronte sisters, uh, you know, Shakespeare, it's really hard to zero in on a book, but it's hard to zero in on a film too. So for today, I'm going to go with The Grapes of Wrath and John Steinbeck. <laughs> Steinbeck was a tremendous writer, um, a great, great choice. One of the, the great American novelists, without question. <laughs> Terry, if you could have chosen a different profession outside of music, what would it have been? I would have liked to be independently wealthy and not have to worry about money if there is such a profession or job as that. <laughs> we'll let you choose that one. Um, we go move on now to um, greatest inspirations in life, but who would you choose as yours? Well, my mother, certainly, she was, uh, my mother, what she, all her life, she wrote, she wrote poetry, and she wrote a novel, she wrote short stories, and she was never really publicly acknowledged for this until in her 94th year, she self-published a a book of poetry, and she brought it down to the local library in the town where she lives. And the mayor of the town happened to see it and read it and called her up and said, we want to make you poet laureate of the town. Wow. And so she, she died in her 94th year, but she was given the honor of being poet laureate and uh, that was that was amazing because she really was somebody who all her life she wrote without being published or being acknowledged or being written about and uh, that was so satisfying and so and and really she was the person I would say in my life that pointed in the direction of how important that is to create things, you know, whether you're drawing pictures or making up a song or something like she really was on that uh, as being important. So I'd have to say she was my biggest in <laughs> inspiration. From your mother as your uh, role model, we move on to newspapers. Do you read a newspaper? 
And if so, which one? I like the Atlantic. Do you know that paper? No, I didn't know the Atlantic. It's a magazine. It's been around many, many years. And they have very in-depth, long articles that I find compelling. I have a subscription to the Atlantic. And if I had to pick a favorite, I'd say that. Terry Roach, what would you choose as your favorite food? And are you a cook by any chance? Well, I do like to cook. However, Gary, my partner, he's a better cook and he does the cooking for us. Usually, sometimes I will. But my favorite food is chocolate. From cookery now to cultural icons, we get all guests to choose their favorite cultural icon. It could be maybe a religious leader, maybe someone who's changed the course of history, maybe a political person, an inventor. Who would you choose as your favorite? Hmm. Well, let me think about that for a minute. <laughs> it could, could be somebody in the music business that's changed music in a certain way or been a, a, a huge influence. I'm sort of inclined to say Bob Dylan. But I'm also inclined to say Buster Keaton. Why would you say Keaton? Interesting choice. Well, I think he just really uh, got inside of a character in a way that um, it was very moving, you know, you, if, you, if you've seen his films. I know he's from way long time ago, but, uh, and he got caught in that time period where when they went from silent to talking, I guess he didn't really make the transition the way other people did, but I, I don't know, if you watch his movies, he was quite special. From the silent movie era, Buster Keaton, now to favourite curse words, what would you choose as your favourite curse word and why, Terry? Dang. What does that mean? I'm not sure. That's one of the, that's one of the reasons I like it, you know? Like, oh, dang, you know? And, and plus, I think... It's Southern, kind of Southern people in, in our country, in, in America, the people in the South say dang more than the people in the North. In fact, I wrote a song called The Dang Beehive. And I wrote it not really knowing what the word dang means, but uh, thinking, I think it's a curse word. <laughs> From curse words to favorite place or holiday destination, where would you choose? I'd have to say St. John in the Virgin Islands, which is where I'm speaking to you from right now. You're selling it to me. I want to be there now, I think. I need <laughs> a holiday cold? as well. Is it cold where you are? It's warming up a little bit. This afternoon's been quite nice. It, it's felt a little bit more like a spring day, but this morning was icy, very cold, but it did warm up a little bit. I'm sounding like a weatherman now. I'm, <laughs> a new career is destined. Um, How cold does it get where you are? It gets to minus, the sort of minus, minus three, you know, something like that. Not overly. It's not like Russian winters or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. it's bearable. You do need a scarf and gloves from time to time. But yeah, the we the weather's not too bad in England. We do get nice summers. Everybody always says, in it's interesting because the British always moan about the weather, but we have really good summers. It is really hot in the summer. Around about June time, it is so, so hot. But everybody, and then everybody in Britain moans and says, so hot, you so muggy, I can't cope with the heat. And I think, 
why not? You moan about the weather most of the time, but our summers yeah. are so nice. <laughs> but there you go. That's my uh, procrastinating over. Um, who would you say next? I hate to ask you this question, a musician, but who would you say is your favourite music artist? And what would you cite as your favourite album of all time? Maybe the album you go back to for a particular reason or moment in your life what would you choose i would have to say van morrison and the album is his band and street choir what would you choose next terry as your greatest achievement to date um getting to the be to be age 70 without getting my head handed to me, <laughs> which is an expression my father used to use. You know, you're going to get your head handed to you. <laughs> and finally, Terry Roach, the final your take question. How do you wish to be remembered? I wish I could leave something to somebody. I really do. You know, I wish I had, because I know people that could really use, I know somebody who's getting kicked out of his home and, you know, it's like I'd like to be able to have a lot of money and give it to somebody. I'd like to be remembered as somebody that left something behind <laughs> for somebody else. You know, I don't feel like, me being here on the earth is uh, anybody that really looks up at the stars at night, like tonight we have this full moon, it's amazing, you know. Uh, the stars here in the Caribbean, you're looking up, it's, you know, you look at that and you realize that you and your little life is not that big a deal, you know. But if you could generate something that kind of you know, that you could leave behind that would be of value to somebody else. To me, that would be the way I'd like to be remembered. That's a lovely way to end the interview. Great philosophy, <laughs> help others, and nice introspective on life. Thanks for sharing your life, career, all the things you've achieved over the course of the last 60 plus minutes. I must Admit, Terry, I um, I felt a little bit honoured and it was very nice of you to approach me to be part of your take. And I felt, you know, very humbled that you sort of sent me that message and asked to be take part in a Your Take interview. And it kind of meant quite a lot to me. Um, so thank you kindly for sharing your story. Thanks for reaching out. And I wish you all the very best for the future. And I've also very much enjoyed talking to you and hearing your perspective on life, all the things you've done, all the things you've not done as well, but it's been, um, yeah, been an interesting perspective and I wish you all the best success with the, the book and the, the new project as well. Yes, thank you, James. And also, I would like to mention that the book is only available through my website, which is terryroach.com. You know, it's not sold anywhere else. So if anybody wants to get the book. And also, I just want to thank you because I think you're doing a great job at your uh, profession. I'm not sure what made you think to want to interview people and do a podcast, but I think you have a talent for it. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. And will will we ever see you this side of the Atlantic, Terry? You never know. <laughs> Watch this space. Right. I mean, I, you know, um, go, uh, you know, if, if I'm invited places, I will go if I can afford to, you know, and if it looks like something interesting. And if I don't think I'm going to get tomatoes thrown at me by a hostile audience, 